It's the Friendly Fire Show, episode 155 for the end of June 2020. I'm one of your hosts, Steve from Survivor. I'm Ben from Survivor. The other half. And that's us. <laughs> You'd think we'd be better at this by this point, oh, yeah. but we're not. Well, I didn't, know I, I didn't know I was a host. I thought I was just a recurring guest. No, you're but definitely Tano, a host. Actually. I believe he was a special guest star. Special guest, <laughs> That's a Gaetano. throwback to the classic Friendly Fire show. The Ballad of Gaetano. No, because no don't, one... don't you remember he was special guest star? Every oh, episode. he certainly was. Yeah. You don't remember that? Because he showed up yeah. like once every seven years or so. Yeah, it was a recurring we... joke. This is like going back to 2014, so this is retro. You and I are here consistently every couple of weeks. <laughs> so that counts. Yeah, uh, right. And there's actually been quite a lot mm. since our last uh, meetup. So we've already talked about the PS5 and stuff, but we've got a whole bunch of new game reveals to discuss. So we should just probably jump straight into it with um, the thing that happened today on Thursday, the 25th of June at the uh, time of recording, the Avengers war table live stream, which was at the very convenient time of three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Australian Eastern Standard, so 2.30 for the weirdos in Adelaide where there's no COVID cases and blah, blah, blah. Oh, sorry. Actually, Ben, sorry. COVID update. How's your COVID going? Yep, yep. I'm going good. I've been to a pub recently, so everything's back to normal. Uh, Yeah. It's just your backward state that's ruined everything. Ask me how it's going here in Victoria. Yeah. (laughs) Victoria's great. How is it going in the COVID swamp? We have no cases. It's fine. Mm. It's no worries. Um, we're we're just okay. plodding along. We don't have people who uh, were testing positive and knew it and then went to hang out with their families. We're just, you know, we're all completely sensible people here in Victoria and we're just doing fine. Mm, okay. It's not, that's not true. Well, I won't be coming over anytime soon. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed. Um, though your premier has no. not uh, gone as far as New South Wales premier and said that you shouldn't entertain the uh, the possibility of visitors, but I don't blame New South Wales for doing that either, to be honest. It, at this point. That's true. I can come to Victoria. I can't get back to South Australia. So that's the safety issue, apparently. And you can't Fine, stay here in. because this is now my office, Ben. This is not a spare room any longer. I need to work here. I need to do things. Mm. Uh, important and stuff. COVID chat okay. done? That's done. All right, Avengers chat on. Week. Have you watched mm. the uh, the war table or do I need to summarize? Oh, I watched bits and pieces. I watched the story trailer. I watched some gameplay of Thor. Uh, I watched one other thing. Is that the gist of it? That's all that happened? I didn't watch the full thing. I just watched the, well, I think two or three of the trailers because we had this random opportunity to talk about Avengers with Crystal Dynamics, but we were given it today. So I had like 20 mm. minutes to get across the information and the the live stream was 30 minutes so i couldn't have done that um so that will be at the end of this podcast we're gonna have like a bonus 25 minute special interview just like tacked on the back um but it was like a good chat i talked i, ta- I talked with scott amos and uh sean Askeg. um he is the creative director and he used to be the creative director on uncharted at naughty dog uh phil someone which is horrible he is the war zone director and vince who came very late to the zoom meeting and he is the combat director and he talked to me about customization so it was a pretty good chat like for a a, a lack of prep of stuff to be honest but um like the three well, i guess key points I... were like <laughs> go ahead I was going to say, I had a horrible chat with no preparation to some Avengers guys at E3 last year. I didn't know I had the booking. I thought I had the booking to see the game. I had a booking for an interview only. I hadn't seen the game yet. And then all I'd seen was the, it must have been an Xbox or someone's press conference. All I had to talk about was that. And they weren't talking about it. Just like, so it's that was E3 like... You know, I don't think that's on you. Like is, any is, E3 uh, is people... Yeah. I totally talked to you, sorry. Any E3 people have their own like talking points to hit and you can ask about like what color is the sky and they'll somehow manage to twist it into oh well That's thank true. you for asking about this uh this combat mechanic of uh dodging which uh we've spent 17 years just developing to get it perfectly pristine but yeah like it's fine um 
uh, it was good, I think. So the, 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 the three key points were Modoc is the main villain. He's like, mm. if you've seen the Green Lantern movie with the guy with like, the gigantic head, he's that dude, basically, but in the Marvel Universe. Um, so I like spoilers for the, uh, the, the chat that you're going to hear later on. Um, we talked about like how it's probably easier to put in a character like that in a video game as opposed to like dropping him into the Marvel Cinematic Universe as an example. Um, they did a whole bunch of stuff about the war zone, which I was a little bit confused about, and you'll find that out in the interview as well, but they kind of clear, like clarified how that all works. Um, and they dealt a lot with customization as well. So we got into that as well. It's pretty good. I think I don't have a, a lot to say. That's not just going to be me retreading the interview. So unless you had anything you mm-hmm. wanted to say about it, probably go I still on. don't know that much about this game. So I saw maybe five minutes of gameplay it was Thor versus some spider looking mech boss. Uh, and there's some parts of it look really cool. And some parts of it look like a standard mash attack. Like, so I, I don't know what to make of it from a gameplay point of view. It's destiny. It's destiny with superheroes. I feel. Oh, so you and will I still it. feel like that's accurate. Well, the, yeah, theoretically. Mm. That's your, um, you in a like, the superheroes destiny. That's your things. There's a giant disconnect, though, between the story campaign and the Warzone stuff, in my mind, from what I understand. So the Warzone stuff feels like very much endgame stuff, like a raid. Or, like, I, I guess like a strike in Destiny language, but like it seems like it's you don't have to do any of the Warzone stuff. You can just barrel through the campaign and never touch the Warzone stuff. Or you can delve into it. It's, it's, it's weird. Like, it's a very disconnected game from what i get from what they're saying okay. whereas i would have hoped it would have been more married together like it's called the avengers you're supposed to be a team of people like i felt like there would be more emphasis on like a cohesive group unit that's not just ai just people fighting with you like actual people that you're doing stuff with but i don't know have a listen later ben and let me know if we'll talk about it next week or next fortnight or whatever you know what is married together the xbox one and xbox series x version because this has smart delivery and same thing on ps4 whatever that's called and and there's a a confirmed uh graphic or frame rate uh option for ps5 and they basically said that in the interview yeah that's that's going to be on xbox as well which obviously it would be but like it's nice just to have the actual answer from people Mm. um and they wouldn't speak really as to why the cross play is only between platforms not yeah it's cross gen not cross play yeah so your saves will go from ps4 to 5 and your saves will go from xbox one to xbox series x Mm. And the crossplay works between PS and Xbox, but not yet anyway. It can it sounds like they're probably gonna iron it out from the sound of it, but like I can't say for certain. It sounds like they're trying to get crossplay across the board. Um but there's a lot of games that have the smart delivery esque style between generations but are are keeping the crossplay to like yeah. Dirt Five is another example of that, and we previewed that on the site. I don't have a lot to say about that. It's a racing. Do you know what this does do? As far as I'm aware, this does show that PS4 to PS5 saves are possible. We we're talking about this last episode. Yeah, we didn't is, know if that could be done. Well, but and and you still haven't heard anything about it from Sony, so you're getting mm. it kind of from third parties. So obviously, the third party person can take your save, and it might it might be something as simple as. It's a Square Enix game. You log in with your Square Enix account and they do something on their end. Hopefully not not because you just want it to be Sony to Sony like without any any effort, but at least there's the option for that to happen. So like it it sounds like Sony will be able to do this on PS4 to 5, but the reason that they haven't like confirmed that to me is just mind-boggling. Like it's it's a no-brainer at this point and it's causing confusion for people. So why wouldn't you just do it? It is very strange. Uh, what else happened this week? So we had that from Square Enix today, and then we also had EA Play. That was a few days ago now. A week and a bit a ago, ago, actually. Yeah, so That's within our fortnightly zone. <laughs> uh, it counts. Now, this one was on at a reasonable hour for us. It was on at like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. or Nine? something. Nine, yeah. Something like that. Uh, I still didn't watch it. <laughs> but I got the, I was at work, I suppose that's why. Uh, but I got the gist of what was happening. So Star Wars Squadron seems to be the major announcement. 
That yeah, was there wasn't cool. a terrible amount that was like actually announced because everything got got leaked ahead leaked. of time. Yeah. But um, still exciting. Comes out in October. Um, Crossplay. You are a single player campaign. Good and bad guy. Republican. No, it's not. What is it now? It's first the, order and uh, the new republic. The resistance that's oh it. yeah yeah but they're still the new rep- anyway yeah so those no one the, remembers the, the same ones from the kylo ren movies um mm. and in the single player you play as both uh, a good pilot and bad pilot depending on which one you think is good and bad because you play as both doesn't matter um and then there's like three main multiplayer modes i think i feel like okay something like well, that pretty cool so hmm. yeah. and ea have well, seem to have learned their lesson i think they said no microtransactions and yep. they're not even charging full price. I've said this is a budget release, which is very non-EA. And the first like dedicated release from EA Motive, um, who have helped with some Star Wars games and were formed a while ago, really now. Um, and Jade Raymond either was heading them or still is. I can't remember now. It seems like people kind of flick back and forth too many times for me to remember, mm. but um, I can't that's exciting. Um, the other thing that was kind of big from... EA Play was that Skate 4 was like name dropped, but it seems like it's probably, I don't know, like five years out at this point. What, what would you wager? Yeah, I think they were just kind of saying, we know you've wanted this for a long time. Here it is. We're finally doing it. Uh, yeah, it didn't look very soon. And it would have been super weird if it was coming out this year when Activision <laughs> bring back Tony Hawk. Well, but, not only is Tony Hawk coming out, but there's Session in Skater XL. So, like, we went from zero skateboarding games ever to, like, an inundation of them. And mm. now Skate 5 is coming out. So, like, people who used to be excited for Skate 5 should still be excited. But they have so many other skate games that they can probably just, like, lean into and they'll be fine. And yeah. I, oh, I can't remember if it was Session or Skater XL is implementing like literally the the control scheme from Skate 3 into it. Like it wasn't going to have it, and now it does because they're like, you demanded it, so we're going to do it. So I feel like if you want a skate game, Skate 4 is exciting, but there are so many other skate games that you can jump into right now, like or in the next month or whatever. Like so... That's good, yeah. though. Like, it's a good time to be a skate fan, like a skater fan. That was the big announcement. The other ones I didn't even note down because they would just kind of slip past. I should probably uh, talk about Rocket Arena because I got to preview it early and we did a whole bunch of stuff around it. Um, it is a game made by a whole bunch of multiplayer devs uh, from titles like Gears and Halo and <sighs> Call of Duty and so on and so forth. Um, Kevin Anderson who came to Australia and I met him at the first EB Expo, like the grossest EB Expo, like the PAX oh, yeah, yeah. that started off as the grossest PAX yeah, was um, I met him. And weird, yeah. It was Halo, must have been Halo 5 Guardians. He was the multiplayer lead on it. And he's a really nice guy. He's Canadian. Um, he was living in Seattle, obviously, because Halo. Anyway, um, he is the head of this studio. Um, Rocket Arena was announced like a year ago through Nexon, um, the Eastern publisher who do other games that I can't even pull out of the top of my head right now. Um, Like halfway through this cycle, probably like six months ago, Nexon said, ah, we've dropped it. We, we, we have a disagreement on how that works. And obviously they've partnered with EA for this. Um, It's really fun. It's like a three V three multiplayer game where you just, you only have rockets and it's like a hero class thing where like everybody has their own personalities and different like rocket methods and different ways of firing and different like alternate abilities and stuff. Um, and like the main conceit is that you don't ever die. You just kind of get like hit enough that you get rocketed off the map and it counts as like a point against you. And then you fly back onto the map and keep fighting. And then there's different modes and stuff. Um, but to me, it, it plays very much like a free to play three V three game, but first strike which is the the dev team and ea have decided this is a premium game that's going to cost you 60 bucks Ooh. um and like it's fun but it's, is it like more fun than apex which is free no is it more fun than apex which is free and you have to have like paid cosmetics if you want to take them no and rocket arena has a 60 dollar entry and paid cosmetics it's like oh that's a you're that's you're asking fail. a lot of money from people 
So yeah, I don't like, it's fun. Would I recommend it? No, because it's expensive for what it is. And that's, that's the crux. All right. There you go. Back to classic EA with that one. So good luck to them. Speaking of classics, but not classic EA, uh, Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. I see it's what they did there. I see what they, they did there. But if you look at the underlined words, it's uh, actually, it's about dick. Is it? Well, I didn't Somehow, notice yeah. that. that. That was the, uh, the meme I saw. It was actually quite funny. Yeah. I um, did watch the trailer and at the end they say, they make a joke. How many times have you beaten this guy? And he goes, three times. Just three? I thought it was more. No, three. So there... But there's been more than three, Ben. Mm, that's, is that the joke? That's the joke. That's the joke. They're disowning them. And I think that would have been a great joke if like Naughty Dog was making it again, like it was going back to the original developer and they were disowning the rest, but that's not happening. So I don't really get the joke. I, um, I guess it has a number. Somehow Toys for Bob is better than the other hacks that have taken on the franchise since Naughty Dog, I guess, is the, is the joke. Yeah. We'll um, see. Maybe it's just been so long. They're like, all right, forget that. I don't Toys for Bob is like decent though. They've done a lot of the Spyro stuff of late, and they did the did they, they did do... the Spyro remaster for sure. I think they did the Crash one too. That might not be true. No, Vicarious Visions did the Crash remaster. That's true. And maybe did Toys for Bob do a bunch of Skylanders? Maybe which is very they much did, in and they did they house. did Spyro trilogy yeah. reignited or whatever it was called. Okay, so they did that. Pretty one. good. All they're right, not, so they're not bad. They've, but they're like one of those staple, like Vicarious Visions and like Raven. They're like one of those, like Activision has been there forever studios that like do really competent work, but like don't get a lot of credit for it. Mm. Um, so like, I don't think it'll be bad. It'll be pretty good. But like, I also, I don't know, like Crash gameplay is kind of dated to me. So I'm not sure if like a new game is going to, I feel like the Crash remaster did really, really well. Yeah, because it played well, but because it was also like that hit of nostalgia that you were after as well. So it'll be interesting to see how this does. I think it did pretty well, but you're right. I think I think we'll do well. But people played the remaster because they knew it, not because it was an amazing game on its own. Anyhow, (laughs) Um, uh, Spider Man. We were right. So (laughs) I think we were right. I'm going to call it as a win for us. Uh, I haven't gone. I haven't gone back to listen to the tapes, but we said on the last episode something along the lines of "Can't help but notice there's no two in the title." Is it not a full sequel? Now there was wild speculation only about an hour after we recorded. People saying some people saying it's a full remaster of the original game plus some DLC. Other people saying no, it's like that infamous spin-off and the. Uncharted Lost Levels, I think it was called. Uh, Lost Legacy? Lost Legacy. That makes more sense. Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. The, you know, your $60 um, budgety game that's about five hours. So that is what we are getting in the end. And I think the confusion was because some exec from Sony said something like, it's an expand expanded or enhanced version. And what they they said, like full on expansion, like quotes Mm. expansion quote. Yeah, what they, what I think they meant is we're using the same level. So we're not building any level. We're just kind of putting a new story in this world, which makes sense because it's still New York and they yeah. might add on some new areas here and there, but the bulk of it's already done. And so that's why it's so quick. You know, they're probably making this game for about 12 months and that's it. So yeah, I think that's what they meant. It's going to be smaller. I think it's going to be interesting to kind of, they should have said that when they announced it. They shouldn't have let people think that this was a full launch title sequel. Uh, and now where do we go release point are they going to make this super cheap one to give it to people and to also kind of say this isn't the proper sequel or do they go sony and say no nah, it's nearly full price it should be like 30 american 60 australian it's probably what that's it even be, that's even a lot i don't know it's yeah it's yeah like they've, they've taken the same manhattan from the first game the original game and they've like basically swapped out the peter parker avatar for miles and we'll put some new scenarios in. Like, it's that's fine. But um, I don't know. I was, like, so excited for it because I'm like, oh, this is like a Spider-Man game where, like, a minority is going to take over and, like, be the lead. And it's like, oh, it's like a half game. It's like, oh, it's, okay, good. We give we give the white guy the full game. We give the Latino. Is he Latino? Miles Morales. 
I think he is. God, that's horrible. We give the minority, just to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn, um, a half game. That's cool. Like, whatever. That's fine. And, like, that's the same for Uncharted, really. They have, like, Nathan Drake being in yeah. all the leads. And then they give, like, the women this, the little, like, half side game. It's like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> you don't fully yeah. trust it? Is that what you're saying? In I mean, my I mind? Th- I suppose it's giving them the main character has the main game and a smaller character has the spin off. So in Spider-Man's case, it's Peter Parker is what people associate. But they're with both Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Oh, not well, yeah, okay, true, but not as much of late. I feel like mm. with things like Into the Spider-Verse, etc., that Miles Morales is like literally his own Spider-Man, his own person. So, and like that, even like if 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 I wanted to like dump on this, like I was dumping on The Last of Us Two for uh, representation, like Miles Spider Man Miles Morales, like you don't have to call it that. Like he is Spider Man. That's you didn't call the first one Spider Man Peter Parker, but anyway, that's just me. Retrospectively, uh, it could be renamed that. We didn't know there'd be a sequel at the time. Good point. Good point. Spider Man Earth sixteen six sixteen six sixteen. I think that's the right one. But I let think me just ask in- you this. They're both if, the 60s. Anyway. If, uh, say this was the plan all along, that they were going to do this as the second Spider-Man, do you think if we weren't having a launch console right now, they would give it more time and make it a proper sequel? Do you think it's the PS5 coming out, they've kind of said, let's do this quicker? Um, yes and no. Because something I've, I've kind of, and I, like, I know I dump on Sony so much, but Sony to me has always been like, at any opportunity, They'll be like, here's a game that comes seven years from now. So, like, I feel like they could have done the Last of Us thing with Spider-Man and put out the Peter Parker original one, enhanced, at launch, and then done a proper Miles sequel a year out of that if they needed extra time. But they didn't. They chose to do this. So, there's a lot to unpack with that. Um and I don't, I don't like how Sony will give you like eight years of notice for a single game and sometimes just the next time turn around and give you like a game straight away. But it's only like a half a game or a third of a game. But they don't tell you that at the, at time. the start. They just, they wait. So like, I don't know. There's a, I, there's a lot that I disagree with in that. And that's like maybe more to the marketing people than to Insomniac. But um, well, yeah. it's certainly one of Sony's strategies. It's the third one now. So we had Infamous Uncharted and now Spider-Man. So that's probably their three. If they do God of War next, and then maybe a little... Horizon had DLC, so I suppose it's not going to get this. But yeah, it's certainly a a tactic which other major publishers don't do, except for Bethesda. They did it with Wolfenstein. Um, People seem to accept it. So maybe it's just us who don't like it. I just... I don't know. If if you're upfront about it to begin with, then 100%. And I think they were with like Uncharted The Lost Legacy. I don't think there was ever any question of whether or not it was like a full game or a kind of like a little side one. But um, yeah, that's beside the point. So. Hmm. Um, so we were right. You're right. You've, you've won right. me over. Totally yeah. right. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Cyberpunk 2077 um, delayed yet again. It comes out now the 17th of March, I think. March, November. I think oh, November. March. God. Uh, <laughs> where, where do I uh, think we are? So it's going to be, an, uh, that's probably a Series X launch title, am I right? 17th of November, we can't be too far away by that stage. Um, well, it's definitely not coming out on next gen until 2021, they said. Cool. Obviously, the backwards compatible versions will be available on your new console, though playing based off the old code. Um, but if I'm being honest, mm. I would not be surprised if Cyberpunk gets delayed proper until... 2021 and will actually come out on next gen as a next gen release not an enhanced old gen on next gen title does that make sense that makes sense i think that is a big chance of happening but it would still come out on current gen they wouldn't just scrap those versions oh no but i like i don't think it i don't think it's going to come out in november is what i'm getting at so what have they had two delays so far or three i think at least uh, two. Uh, probably yeah probably three it's it's had a couple. Uh, it's due for another one. Well, it should no, have been out by now. Is is the bottom line? They did say when they announced this that the game is done. We just need to basically fix everything and polish it. So it's hard to read between the lines. Is a couple more months going to make that difference, or is this like it needs another six to twelve months to get that done? We have no idea. 
I'm going to sort of read between the lines with a little bit of magic cognitive power to 2.30 a.m. from now. Hmm. If if you it tell me to shut up if you think I should shut up, Ben. But um, it seems like if I knew more than I did now, that having more time would just polish some rough edges, and maybe having more time would polish more rough edges. If I knew anything, is what I'm saying. So like any game development, then more yes, time correct, makes correct. for a better launch product. <laughs> So uh, you can read uh, Adam Matthews' words on Cyberpunk 2077, which I know nothing of, from uh, 2.30 in the morning on the 26th of June, which will be slightly after this podcast. Well, I look um, forward to that. I think I did really well then, Ben. What do you think? (laughs) Uh, Well, I haven't read it, so uh, not that I could read it because... It's like 2,800 words and it's like utterly hilarious so you should definitely read I'm it looking forward um, to it. something that he could say already is that he basically just tried to play using the cool stat so hijinks ensued i think is what i can say without okay. really pushing uh, it i'm looking forward to it it's pretty good what else what else do we got uh there's not much else the only other there was one more fake e3 announcement which was pokemon snap is back and then you see, you're not excited. I can just tell. No, because I don't. I didn't play the. I didn't play that. <laughs> I needed I to be. Have an N64. It was an N64. N64, yeah. and it was cool at the time because it was just like, look at these graphics, so realistic. I'm going to take a photo. Like it was garbage, but at so the like, time, did you go and know. grab your parents and make them look at the screen and be like, look at this Charizard? <laughs> yeah, it's first of all, Charizard's not a real thing, so they're not going to get it. But it, when you're like, it's so real. Uh, yeah, it's anyway. I think that's why. <laughs> So basically, here's what the game was. It was you were on rails in like a boat for most of it. I think there was a few transportation means and you just took photos of Pokemon like to the side. You're kind of like, it's like you're in a, like a safari ride looking at animals on the other side of you. That's it. That's the game. This sounds like garbage. Just, I just, I uh, want to put that out. And I think it was it's just weird. the fact that 3D games were cool at the time. It was like, wow. So I am thinking... This is the type of game that fanboys say, I want, let's do that again. There's a reason they haven't done it again, and it's going to be boring as hell, but we'll see. <laughs> so you, you obviously haven't played Pokemon uh, Teeth Brushing? What was it called? Pokemon, Pokemon Smile. Smile. Now, that's the attitude I had, but I did see a couple of people tweet saying, anyone who's like, you know, annoyed about this obviously doesn't have a small child, because if you did... And you try to get them to brush their teeth every night. Something like this is going to make a big difference. So, okay, fair play. I think maybe there's a point for that. The thing which annoyed everyone is they announced these two in one direct and they said, but wait, there's more. And it's coming next week for some reason. Oh, you've missed one, Ben. Pause. You've missed Pokemon Cafe Mix, which is currently available on Switch and iOS and Android. And I've played it for a while. And it's actually quite fun, though the worst. Have you not played it? Obviously, no. Not. Uh, fun it's, and the worst. It's like it's it's kind of like a Candy Crush clone where you're not doing the like the proper Candy Crush, just like making the chains, but you are okay. still doing that. So you like um, you will have a a map with like picture like an oval basically, and there's like ten Eevee heads and 10 Charizard heads, and 10 Pikachu heads, and you click on it, because it's wholly a mobile game that they've put on Switch, and it doesn't need to be on Switch, but it has a touchscreen, so it still works. So, like, you're on your phone, because that's what you should be playing this, and you Mm. click on the Pikachu head, and then you have to, like, move your hand over all of the Pikachu heads that you can see on the screen to get a chain, and then they disappear. And if they touch, like, a sugar cube, the sugar cube partially is destroyed and if you chain enough things together you get a special power and like charizard can shoot fire from left to right so like you destroy sugar cubes and you destroy like whipped cream puffs and you destroy nuts and you chain heads together to get points and like doing this makes a cafe latte Okay, so that's and then (laughs) giving the latte to Evie makes Evie like you a little bit more, and then Evie will eventually decide that she doesn't want to pay you to make lattes; she wants to work for you and make lattes for other Pokemon. 
Um, it's kind of fun. Like if you have some time to kill, like it's like, eh. but okay. it's a it, little puzzle game. Gotcha. It like Candy Crush will eventually just get you to a level where you cannot possibly hope to beat it, and you just have to either come back later on and it just randomly suddenly gets easier because you've waited and like restored your hearts to try more levels mm. or you can dump cash into it to t- win the level as well so it's it's weird i, I kind of like it but it's gross anyway that was the third game and then they announced that they were announcing another game which was yeah, that got people excited and in between these two things uh someone from nintendo said that Nintendo were done with mobile games. They hadn't made enough money uh, and they weren't the market they wanted to be in. They wanted to be on Switch, so that's what they were going to do from now on. Then they announced Pokemon Unite, a mobile slash Switch game. So Slash MOBA, which is actually kind of yeah. cool in, in terms of like the first for the franchise. It was just a weird thing for them to just come out and say, we're done with mobile games. Oh, wait, except for this mobile game we didn't announce. And everyone was expecting like a Pokemon Let's Go Johto. Yeah. They, so like what is that gold and gold silver? Gold and silver. There was some I think there were a lot of Pokemon from them in the back of the first direct, a lot of plushies and posters and things. So people assumed they film this on the same day. It's gonna be that. Then it mm. wasn't uh classic Nintendo, I'm gonna say. They've gone with a <laughs> we've hyped you up and we've not delivered what you wanted. I didn't not saying it's gonna be bad, I have no idea, but it's not what people thought from the hints at all. So it looks kind of cool, but also I don't really like MOBAs, so... But then, like, I don't think Nintendo ever, like, latches onto a genre like this, and it's just, like, a straight-up kind of, like, a MOBA experience that you get from the likes of... It'll be the Nintendo well, like, version. a league or something? Yeah, so, like, I, I think it, it's too early to comment on if it's any good or not, but it's, yeah, it was, it was a random pivot from what was expected. Yeah, hopefully they have some more stuff. They couldn't have just been planning Pokemon for E3, so let's hope there's something else. Well, you never know. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to talk about before we get to this like Avengers like side bonus thing? Uh, not really. That's the news. Bam. And yeah. We still don't know the price of the Xbox Series X or the PS5. Oh, we'll Come do it a- back to us in November and we'll probably have something resembling a price. We probably Actually, will. Quick check in on the next gen watch. Phil mm-hmm. Spencer was tweeting that he is very impressed by what is he's seeing for the July event. So they got rid of Well, June. you would hope so. You would bloody hope so. He's hyping it up. And after they hyped up the last one and it went so horribly wrong, he's hyping it up again. So you got to hope they learn their lesson and we're going to see some proper gameplay. Oh, they're starting to drop some like Halo Infinite teases. So we know that the um, the banished, the major enemy made up of like covenant people, like brutes, primarily brutes and um, grunts and hunters and da 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 da. They're likely going to be the primary antagonist of Halo Infinite, which is kind of cool. Like we haven't seen brutes since Halo Three, I think. So kind of cool if you're into brutes so like i think xbox is starting to ramp that up i'm excited for july i, just, I want a price out of them but i don't think they'll give one because i think they're literally just gonna wait till sony does it they're waiting I think for sony. trying to stall yeah. as much as they can so i don't know what to expect at this point this is historically when it would have been announced about two weeks ago so we're hmm. beyond the deadline who knows what's going to happen covid man just blame everything on covid hmm. it is coming out this year though i'm confident well, of that so they say but, yeah. but we don't know for they, sure they can't afford to delay yeah that's true um hit up the site for the cyberpunk write-up for i did dirt five i did well else did i do project cars i did the crossfire x beta which we had the exclusive on for the country and i think ben and i are going to drop into the open beta right now which is exciting um stuff coming up very soon includes a look at harmonics fuser fuser which is like a DJ game, uh, No Straight Roads, which is another like musically themed um, game from people behind the Final Fantasy series, and there's other stuff. It's like it's been as crazy as an E3 time, but like a little bit more spaced out, which just means I end up being more tired than I was and drinking more than I the should. Last be, longer, I think, is how it works. Yeah, it's Great. been relaxing for me. I haven't had to do anything, so. <laughs> Great. <laughs> because it's the middle of the year and the ad revenue is down. So I'm just trying to t- 
take as many things through. as I can. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's just going well. Anyway, how do we find you on the interwebs? I ben. am Ben underscore Salter on Twitter and yourself. Uh, that is a good question. S right A U. I literally forgot on things and stay tuned for me explaining why I forgot to record the start of the interview about Avengers coming up next. Hey everyone. Thanks for joining me, Steve, with this podcast supplement. Uh, it is Thursday ahead of the recording of the podcast itself, but we had a chance, uh, earlier in the day to take advantage of a, an interview with Crystal Dynamics. Uh, off the back of this morning's very early morning Avengers Warzone War Table, I should say, uh, live stream. So we had the chance to talk to four people from Crystal Dynamics. We had Scott Amos, the head of the studio, Sean Eskeg, who is the creative director, formerly of Uncharted and Naughty Dog, of course. Uh, we had Phil Terrien, who is the Warzone director, and also we had Vince Napoli join us a little bit later in the interview to discuss combat. Uh, now, we had a Zoom interview, and I recorded with the Xbox Game Bar, thinking I was smart, uh, realized really quickly in that it wouldn't record my own voice, so what I've done is kind of mixed my iPhone recording of myself back in with the Zoom interview. Uh, the only thing that missed the uh, cut was my initial question to the group, and that was pretty easy and straightforward. Uh, last year, literally last year, we were speaking to Scott Amos about Avengers in Melbourne at PAX Australia. Uh, flash forward to a year, Avengers has been delayed, uh, the game is, is being developed in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course PAX Australia, as we know it, uh, isn't happening this year. So I just wanted to ask uh, how that uh, COVID pandemic uh, situation was affecting Crystal Dynamics, and more importantly, if anything positive was coming out of it, rather than all the negative stuff that we're uh, constantly faced with, especially in Victoria here, with our second wave kind of uh, hitting us in the face. So... The interview lasts about 25 minutes, uh, and we'll just jump in straight into that question. Uh, it'll be Scott Amos kicking off, so enjoy. No, actually, we have a much different tone about this, to be brutally honest. It has been, it has been an it, I am so fucking proud of this team, because at the end of the day, when this started coming our direction beginning of the year, we started immediately prepping, like, what if, what if kind of scenarios. And then, right, literally, I think it was March 13th, we literally told our ops and our IT team, guess what? Everybody who works in our Redwood City studio and everybody who works in our Crystal Northwest studio, they're going to be working from home starting Monday. And we're going to move hundreds of people out and say, put them at home, make them effective, get them set up whatever they need to. And they did it in like a matter of a couple of days. And these guys can speak to the experience that we went from an almost exclusively on-site studio. We had a handful of folks we'd experimented with for off-site maybe over the last 18 months or so, like a couple of remote employees, like an animator here or a VFX person there. This was one of those, nope, we're doing this. And we're doing this, and we call it the crystal way. Like most minutes are one minute is one minute. Crystal minutes are like seven minutes for one. Like we are that much faster at getting some of these things done. We put our mind to it. And these guys just dove in and said, whatever it takes. And so the first couple of days were like, oh, we didn't think about this. And what about a mouse? And what about a headset? But within a matter of days, I am so proud of the team that we both put everybody externally. And then as a team, we started from the beginning saying, embrace this as a new way of life. We took it as a very serious tone of saying, look, this isn't something that's going to go away quickly. Let's assume we're in for the long haul. And as a team, commit yourselves to finding ways to be as productive or more productive at home. And we will consider this as a new version of distributed dev for the future as even a perk of how we build games in the future for crystal and so for us it's been one of those just taking it by the horns and saying no damn it they're not gonna let this beat us so instead we're gonna say what can we do to wrestle it to the ground and take ownership of it we've certainly discovered a few heartaches like it's not quite the same when you're in a lab full of every monitor that you have and every console type and pc that you have you can see everything and compare stuff and it's a much different way of doing qa sean and phil and i particularly we talk about the conference rooms we miss just having a whiteboard that we can all go to and sketch things on and lay out how it goes and we can do digital ones but it's not, not quite the same but we really did commit to this very early on like nope we're going to make this happen we're going to assume we're going to be you know doing this work from home probably through launch even beyond launch so let's settle in and let's take ownership of it and i think one of my happiest stories was within maybe three weeks four weeks three four weeks after we started this people literally called me zoomed me and they started saying jesus i've actually talked more to the people i work with than when they sat across from me 
because there's this weird like I sit in the same space, we'll go play board games together in the hub, or we'll come back. But it was be, it's become one of these like you have to pay attention because people know if you're like I'm over here on my phone, you're like okay, you can't do that anymore. Like you're sitting in the same space. That intimacy has actually changed in a positive way. So I think there are people in the team. I will be blunt that there is you know some percentage are like I desperately want to get out of my apartment or I want to go back to the office. But in general, I think we have more positive than you would expect as far as the switch. I think these guys' smiles probably uh, echo that same sentiment. Is there anything that you guys wanted to add on top of Scott's comments? I'll kind of just throw it out there, and if anybody wants to pick it up, by all means, please do. If it's Warzone, I probably have an idea who's going to answer, but we'll leave it at that. I'll tell you a super short thing. Like The, the thing that really impressed me is that people people's ingenuity like there's no manual for doing this right so overnight like the leadership team just kind of got together and went like how do we do this and we we sort of crowdsourced it like we met with our team we're like okay how should we do our meetings how should we review the game how should we handle meetings like just everything was new and people came up with the most creative ideas like just even like the lack of whiteboard like how do we do this oh we're gonna john madden this like over that on Zoom and on Slack, and you could do this at the same time. And like people are just finding super creative ways to function. And it's just, it's really easy to go down sort of like the negative path when something kind of dramatic happens. Like it's easy to just go, oh man, this is going to suck. But people just totally took it in stride. Like I, I, I like to make the joke that because we're developers, we like hard mode. Like this just ended up being hard mode for us. People are just like, okay, cool. How do we do this? So yeah, I just, I, I'm proud of the team too. It's just amazing. Yeah, and, and just to echo the same spirit, I think uh, there's a lot of passion behind this game. Uh, there's a lot of fans in the studio. Uh, I don't think you can break their spirit even if you wanted to. Uh, they're, they're, they're so into making this experience amazing for themselves, for the fans outside. Uh, and so much pressure on us to, 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 to excel as a studio that I don't think anything could have stopped that. Uh, but you know, the, the, the smooth transition, as Scott alluded to, it was just so effortless. It felt, at least for me, uh, you know, I was out of the country, I came back in, and it was just like, all right, back in here, even in some ways more effective uh, way of communicating, you know, just on a day-to-day -day and, and being able to bounce ideas as if we were in the room, except I don't have to walk to the other side of the studio. So there's, you know, there is that, and then, you know, Exactly. So there, there are a lot of positives to it. It's just, I think, you know, there's the, the lack of, say, you know, human interaction, like, you know, face to face for sure. But I think the team is actually, you know, evolving and getting better at it and, and certainly adapting, certainly myself adapting. Even Are there a couple things that like will definitely continue on when you have the opportunity to all be in the same office again? No, absolutely. I think we've actually found incredibly effective ways of having some people from both how do I put it? Uh, looking at family situations, looking at the different places our studios are based, commutes and travel times and costs and things, there is actually a, a world of opportunity because we've gotten better at this and because we are every day finding new ways and we are consistently saying, how do we get better at this? How do we get better at this? Because we can get to a point where it is effective to have people off-site, it improves our communication with external co-devs for future projects, for outsourcing teams that we work with, and our own team calling it insourcing. But the idea, like, it is a life-changing opportunity for some people who, like, I have have a personal situation with family member X or kids or something like, how can we actually enable them to work from home? Is it every day? Is it some time, times a week? Is it a flexible tool to say what days and what hours? And I think this is a situation for us that while it's resolving in different places in different ways, you see the data that we do. You have, you know, can look at the same reports we see and some of the data we get. We're like, no, we got we to gotta assume this is a new way of life because we want to keep our team first and foremost safe and healthy. That is the most important thing to us. And so being able to go from that to then say, okay, let's start letting a few people back in who need or really you know, are essential workers, like the IT guys, some of the ops guys. They, you still need people at site to go and hit a reset button on a PC periodically for remote desktop or something like that. And then there's that next set of essential that you can just be more effective. You can't do mocap from home, right? So you got to go on stage somewhere. We have a mocap studio here in our Redwood City office, so there are things that we do have to do. But the great thing is we had two people directing that shoot via FaceTime. They were literally on mounted poles of iPads watching the shoot happen and giving direction to the actual actors that came up. So like, there are things that we will change to make us both efficient and effective and give that flexibility wherever we can. Now, something that I've done a lot differently as part of my job is it used to be go to LA and get hands-on with games as, as the primary source, especially in Australia. 
or, or, or sometimes have someone come to Australia, which is nice too. But um, a lot of preview builds have randomly ended up on my PC in the last couple of weeks, which I really enjoy, actually. It gives you like a proper look at something. Is that something that you're thinking about doing for Avengers or because of the time frame and, you know, like the beta coming up, is it even needed or... Uh, it's a good question about being needed or not. Certainly, we like the idea of saying, look, we have these great tools. We have, as you said, PC, we have Stadia, we have PS4 and Xbox. Consoles get harder as far as, as you know, those just restrictions and getting builds out there. Stadia and PC gets a little bit easier. So we do have some flexible tools that certainly uh, Ryan and the PR team, we've talked about how do we get code into people's hands sooner than later because we can show you everything we want. We can answer every question you have, but when you get your hands on it, there's questions you can ask us and there's things in feedback you were just like, oh my God, I get this now. And so I think it's imperative for us to find whatever new ways we can to get stuff in your hands. Um, I should actually get into questions about what you guys talked about today. Um, I'm, just, I'm thinking this is probably a Sean question, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we've had MODOK uh, announced or featured, I guess, today. Um, and he's admittedly a strange character. I don't know if it would be easy to bring him into the MCU. And I guess the question is, is, is the medium of video games kind of the perfect place to take someone like this villain and, and kind of ease him in without it seeming ridiculous or something? Yeah, and I mean, it, it all to me, it's all earned, right? If you earn it on the narrative, uh, you know, you could make any villain you know, come to life, spring to life. MCU comics uh, and video games. Um, you know, one of the the, the, the setups for Modoc and and our interpretation of Modoc, um, you know, is a little more grounded in our particular story. We're influenced, obviously, by heavily by the comics and, and its portrayal, but we wanted to put our version of it, make sure it sits. He sits in our world, uh, you know, pretty strong and fits in with everything else we've been selling. So you imagine sort of the, the disaster of A-Day, you know, the failings of the Avengers just too high, you know, some people were injured like George Tarleton who becomes MODOK, you know, by the Terrigen Blast. Others like Kamala Khan were infected, uh, you know, exposed to the Terrigen Mist and started displaying powers. Uh, and it was sort of our construct of, you know, the question of, hey, are these really superheroes? Uh, or are they just dangerous, powerful beings? And if you look at closely Phil Sheldon character, you know, you can see some of our comic uh, inspiration uh, drawing from some of those uh, comic book uh, inspirations. But it was challenging the superhero ideology in and of itself. Like, are they dangerous? Are they uh, just uh, superheroes? So, so MODOK uh, uh, was sort of an evolution of that uh, argument. Here you have George Tarleton desperate to protect humanity uh, alongside the Avengers, but a little weary of the Avengers. He's seen them do destructive things before, and, and now he's exposed and now becomes, you know, it has reaffirmed his beliefs that there is no controlling these guys. The only way is through science. And by science, we can harvest these powers. We can even cure this inhuman disease mess that they've left us. Uh, and then we can equip ourselves to better protect ourselves. Um, and that was sort of where Modoc rose as a real formidable villain, one who is presented an intellectually sound argument to the Avengers um, and is able to physically wield technology, you know, through his technokinesis, as we call it, or his ability to control things with this giant mind of his uh, and, and, and put the Avengers powers right back at them, use them, uh, their strengths against them. Um, and divide them from within as well, intellectually. So he is uh, one of the, you know, I'm very passionate, as you can tell, about uh, that villain and, and his ability to truly uh, question, make us question, you know, the need for these superheroes. Now, Scott, this one's directly at you because I think if anything kept hitting me over the head when you were in Australia, it was the crystal lens or the crystal dynamics lens. So how has the crystal dynamics lens been applied to MODOK? How is he, you know, different from what comics fans maybe will expect kind of as from the cookie cutter version of of the villain yeah well i think it's easy for modok to be almost comical in his existence and that's one of the things that as crystal what sean and the team have done is say what would happen if you take a brilliant scientist who's out to do the right thing the nobility of hey i want to do the right thing make the world a safer place to have free internet for everybody and a worldwide Wi-Fi and, and, and phones that charge instantly, like like just the small things you could think of of any of the 
any of the top five tech cult companies you could picture right now. And the idea of take those into that world and then say, that guy running it is just out to make the world a better place. And then this happens, right? This incident happens. What would happen if you're affected by this event? If what used to be the heroes that you're partnered with now became the villains who destroyed San Francisco and the effect it had on you. And I think from the crystal lens, it's like if we take that kind of epic storytelling, but with that human spirit, we look at the inside of this guy feels justified and righteous in what he's choosing to do. He's going down a path of saying, oh my God, look what happened when we had these superheroes involved and the superpowers, they screwed this up and I need to take this back and make these decisions for the mankind to both thrive and survive. So I think the crystal lens is really kind of going back to the heart of who this person is. It's not the mustache trailer like, ah, I'm going to take over the world. Like, that's not his motivation. His motivation is to, as the exact trailer said, end superpowers. The idea of taking them, harvesting them, using them under his control. He's like an enlightened dictator. It feels like the best type of person who can run this world. I'll make the right decisions for all of you. So his intent is very clear and even noble. It gets corrupted as a purpose as he gets corrupted as he evolves. And I think that's one of the things we do well at Crystal is that lens of let's start with something that's familiar i can see myself at a day i could be synchronized with kamala's point of view with her as a character with her as a fan of the avengers with her spirit of wanting to be part of the avengers in some way and then as sean said that diversion of she's affected by Terrigen at that same moment that Tarleton is, she goes down the path of, I believe the Avengers, I love superpowers, I'm now one of them, I want to find my way. He goes down, they've ruined my life, they destroyed everything, they've took everything from me, I'm going to take that back and control it. And I really do think that Crystal Lens is saying, how do we write a story that has these two diametrically opposed point of views and comes back to the core of who they are as humans? Kamala, always there to stamp out injustice. Modoc starts out as Tarleton saying, I am here to make the world a better place. And then what happens? One of them becomes even more noble as she ascends. One of them becomes more corrupted and thinks he's still doing the right thing by trying to wipe out these unchecked superheroes. So for me, that's that crystal lens, that 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 reality check of, yeah, we're going to start here and we're going to grow outward. And it's going to get weirder. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get, as you, as you escalate towards the end of the story, we escalate the threat and the size of like, oh my God, you guys really did destroy this. And you have this giant thing. And what is he sitting in? And how is that? Oh my God, the weapon. Like you just start to see it go from grounded. We're in the back of a limo with a kind of creepy guy to holy shit, who is this Modoc? So I do think that's the fun that we like to have as Crystal is start you here and take you on that journey with us. It rises into that level of chaos. And while it's uh, amazing, I'd assume to write for characters like Captain America, and Iron Man, who are just so instilled in the zeitgeist right now. I think it, it, it's probably a bit easier to handle someone like MODOK because maybe people aren't as aware about the character and, and that kind of stuff. Does it give you some breathing room and some some advantage to to kind of go wild, or is it any different from a Captain America? I think I think it's a different challenge, right? Uh, you know, it's uh, but equally hard. I, I would say, um, you know. Part of what Scott is is speaking to with the lens is that you know grounding this character so that you know we don't lose sight of you know the the, the depth of the story or the depth of the struggle, uh, but staying true to the comic uh, as best as we can. And you know in the comic he you know he can be portrayed a bit comical or or weird or you know a little out of, out there in terms of villains. Um, and how do we take what is his core DNA, and this is where Marvel is really crucial and has been great partners with us, uh, take that DNA and really ground that DNA. Uh, and that's where I feel like the crystal lens is, uh, it's an adaptation period of, this is, this is not a funny character, this is a formidable character. This is a character that is using everything uh, in his power to 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 break or fracture the Avengers from within with sound arguments uh, and uh, not only intellectually but powerful on 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 in, in his attack and what he can wield and and how he you know disrupts uh, and and with this noble cause that has been corrupted right like that's ultimately they all want the best for humanity hero villain uh, Avengers right uh, but seeing how they deal with it is really what makes this unique? We should get on to Warzone. Um, lots of questions. I guess my, my take on the iconic missions is that they're going to be the ones that kind of really feed back into the game's narrative and in play with the heroic missions. Is that accurate? I guess, well, I'm not really sure. There are, hero, there are hero missions that are 
hero iconic missions that are a little bit different than the hero missions, right? The iconic missions are chasing a story thread that Phil can talk about in War Zones. Hero missions are that campaign path, right? That's the... The uh, single player only, straightforward, yeah. So the iconic missions are really feeding back into the single player narrative, but you get to either team up with bots or friends, basically. Or is that just, is that too generalized? Uh, but, but they are all... That's correct in one way that you do you you do have the ability since they're war zones to team up with people in them. But from an iconic side, they do tell story. You say feedback in. I don't want to make it feel like they're required to progress the campaign, but they yeah. will give you the fulfilling experience of like what have they been doing in the five years since A Day, as an example, or how are they also attacking AIM separately? So it is still all part and parcel with the overall narrative. But I just want to make sure it's not that, oh, these, these iconic missions are required to finish the campaign. No, you can go back and do them at the end of the campaign, and they're still there, and you will still get a, filler, a fuller experience of like, oh, what did this stuff mean? But I do think there's, a, there's a, a nuance there, the difference between that hero mission and war zones, and then hero mission and these specific iconic chains. Phil, did I do you justice on that one? OK. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, I can, well, since uh, somebody getting tagged in, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the uh, Warzone missions. So you were talking about the, the iconic hero missions, but there's a lot more stuff. So the, the big thing with Warzones is that if you did complete the campaign, right, when you get to the war table post-campaign, it sets you up for the ongoing fight against AIM just on a global scale at that point, right? So there's a big incentive to following that story thread. So when you get in there, and you've got the shield faction that needs to be rebuilt. You've got the Inhumans that also need some guidance and some help. Um, and you're also going to discover a lot more about what AIM is actually up to. Uh, through that, you're going to play some missions that have some stories. You're going to go after some bosses. You're going to go after some villains. You're going to find some hidden shield caches that will lead you to some secret AIM vaults that have some really cool loot. Um, you also find something that's called hives, which are basically underground gauntlets that are really cool. And there's even some more end game stuff that I, I can't even talk about just yet. But suffice to say that the whole experience of the war table is a story in and of itself. Uh, a really cool thing about it is that you can experience it any way you want. So you were mentioning it earlier. You can absolutely play all that stuff by yourself with the AI companions that are really customized exactly the way that you intended. So the same costume skills and gears that you have or you can play with your friends and everything that is on the war table, that's the online content is supported with quick match matchmaking. So you can, and you can go in and out as you will. So for us, it's really, when you think about it, right? Like there's your own Avengers story to tell just when you complete the campaign, there's a whole other thing that's gets, getting set up here. Uh, so yeah, lots, lots of really, really good content here. I, and I, I try not to think about it in the destiny mindset, but it's hard for me not to because uh, I, played too much Destiny. Um, I know the difficulty in Warzone will scale depending on player count, but do you have the option to hike up the difficulty beyond that, like a heroic or a nightfall kind of style scenario? Yeah, absolutely. You can. There's some content that's set a high, at a higher difficulty period, but you also have control over the difficulty in a war zone. And the thing that's really cool about the difficulty settings in the game is that it doesn't just turn all the enemies into bullet sponges. Uh, it just ends up putting a lot more emphasis on things like dodging, parrying, using the right defensive gear at the right time. So, and it's something I really appreciate about our game because sometimes in online games, it's just, yeah, we're just going to give these things a million hit points and, you know, one shot and you're down. But our game isn't like that. And it's, it's still really accessible. Like, I, I'm sure you've played games where, like, dodging and parrying is, like, super, super hardcore. But in our game, it's you can still get to a good level of mastery, but then when you reach that and you up the difficulty, then it just puts more pressure on you to really see if you've practiced those mechanics well, but it's still totally accessible. I personally really enjoy it. I find it really, really fun to play. And the risk reward obviously ties into all of that because you know the, the higher risk you take, theoretically then the better loot you get to chase and apply and use or trade to vendors and so on and so forth. Oh, absolutely. And there's some really cool uh, loot to get. And that's like a perfect time for Vince to come in. Uh, Vince, you want to talk about some of the cool gear we start getting uh, a little bit more towards Endgame? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, uh, if, if no one's touched on it, I mean, we spent a lot of time with the gear to create not only stuff that would uh, allow you to sort of customize the powers each of the heroes had and customize their play style. So we built all of the perks off of sort of the core play styles that we identified for each hero and the ways you can spec into them on the skill tree, all the gear perks allow you to basically take those choices and sort of get the best 
benefits from those or kind of exploit those or allow you to configure. Uh, then we also have a status effect system, which allows you to basically weaponize a bunch of powers that are not unique to the heroes. They're sort of like more Marvel-like powers. We use cosmic and uh, pin particles, for example. You can use that to weaponize and shrink any enemy in the game. Um, and then at the very, very high end, we have what we call hero sets, and that's very, very custom perks and sets that are sort of split across our different types of high-end content. And those things really help uh, bring out the play styles or offer very custom perks for each of the heroes. And on top of that, we have a prime gear system, uh, which allows you to sort of get the most efficient or most optimal version of each of the gear pieces and sort of chase that stuff down. Uh, in addition to other stuff, we haven't talked too much about trinkets and art custom artifacts, which are uh, uh, items from Marvel lore, which is a big part of our progression system. Uh, yeah, the, the gear system is, is, is fully fleshed out for sure. All right, guys, we've got time for one more quick one. Gotcha. Ooh, which one do I go? Um, it's a really quick one. It'll be a yes or no one. So maybe I can squeeze two out. Um, the PS5 has the confirmed uh, priority for graphics or frame rate. Is that something that we'll get on Xbox Series X as well? Uh, we will definitely, and as always, you've seen some of our games and how we do it. We take whatever platform our software is on and we make it the best for that platform. So we will absolutely give the love and attention to any platform we put our game on. And if I can really quickly, um, I know that we've got cross saves and cross play between generation, so PS4 to PS5. Um, and Xbox to Xbox. Can you speak to why we couldn't have that all happening within the entire um, platform ecosystem? Is it like a technical difficulty or? That, that, is, that is a much harder question to answer. So I, I, I will say that uh, stay tuned. We'll see what the future holds. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for your time. Much appreciated. I know you've got a lot on, so uh, I thank you. So does my cat. I don't know if you saw him before, but I, know, I saw the oh. pan. Oh. I tried to be sneaky about it, but I don't think it worked very well. So I thought I'd just own up to it. But anyway, thank you all so very much. It's the Friendly Fire Show, episode one fifty-five for the end of July. No, it's not. It's the end of June. God, man, let's. I'm starting again. Sorry. You're nearly there. <laughs> Sorry. That's, you know, we fairly do a false start, so you. You're entitled well, to one. That's that's the blooper.